Well, thank you for that introduction. And the, uh, the program says 100 years in this building um, as a title of what I'm going to speak about. That was one of those titles that got into the program without anybody quite knowing what it was. What it should say, perhaps, is on the occasion of 100 years in this building, because what I wanted to do was to look back over the history of the, the society and its various homes. To start with, the Enlightenment. The society is a child of the Enlightenment, absolutely. And uh, this is a painting by Alexander Naismith of Edinburgh, painted in 1826. And it is an epitome of the Enlightenment, if you like. It's midsummer and the sun is coming in from the far northwest. The sun at midsummer comes as close to conquering darkness as uh, in Scotland uh, as it can do. And so here we have the sun standing for the idea of enlightenment. It's, the people are at leisure in the city. Leisure is essential to intellectual pursuits. But if you take the absolute central line of this picture and go down there, you'll see that that building <clears throat> is what we now know as the RSA. And for most of the 19th century, that was the home of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. But Naismith um, not only put the Royal Society of Edinburgh and its companions in that building, including the Institution for the Promotion of the Fine Arts in Scotland and the Trustees Academy, but in the centre, he also put on the same line this which is the tomb of David Hume. And Hume, of course, is um, a central figure in the Enlightenment, although he died shortly before the Royal Society was founded. And this portrait of Hume by Ramsey stands for something which I think we forget so easily, that we know the Enlightenment through its books and indeed through its paintings, but what was really going on was conversation. And Ramsey's portrait of Hume, who was a close friend, is a picture of a man engaged with us, a man engaged in conversation. And uh, conversation formalized gives us societies. There were several societies, Hume and Ramsey formed the Select Society. The first of these intellectual societies was the Rankinian Club, founded in 1716. In uh, 1731, the origins of a society called the Philosophical Society, um, which ran through to be effectively replaced by the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1783. One of the initiators of the new society was William Cullen, professor of chemistry and physics in the University of Edinburgh. And writing in 1782 to um, Henry Dundas, he said, the new society was to comprehend not only medical science, but every species of literary and philological discussion. And Cullen was really, I think, the initiator of the move which was formalized in 1782, notably on St. Andrew's Day, and I don't think that would have escaped the initiators of this great society, by the principal of Edinburgh University at a meeting of the Senators on the 30th of November, William Robertson, to petition the king for a royal charter for the new Royal Society of Edinburgh. And this is the charter with the royal seal attached. And this is the, second, the first page of the charter with the names of the petitioners on it. And they are, um, it's difficult to read, but you have, there's William Robertson, there's William Cullum, there's Alexander Munro, Secundus, Professor of Anatomy, there's Hugh Blair, the Professor of Rhetoric, and Bell Lett, there's Adam Ferguson, there's Adam Smith. It's a, it's a roll call of the Enlightenment. And uh, that is what the society was. It was the Enlightenment formalized. In its original organization, it had a physical and a literary class. And um, this was never lost sight of. The literary class, um, expired somewhat in the 19th century, and the society became predominantly scientific, but never exclusively. And uh, in recent history, the society has rediscovered its, its broader 
original remit. Adam Smith, you see here, was the first president of the literary class. James Hutton was one of the uh, founder members. His theory of the earth presented at two consecutive meetings of the society was one of the um, most dramatic papers ever presented to any learned society, not just changing history of science, but our whole perception of ourselves and our understanding of time. The society met originally in the University of Edinburgh in the library of the old 17th century building, which was replaced between 1788 and 1820 the early 1820s, by the building we now know as Old College. The society was promised rooms in the new building, but that promise was not kept. Even though the society contributed 500 pounds towards its cost. It was a matter of some dispute, as you can imagine. As the new building was very slow in evolving and the society's hopes of having a home there uh, faded, the society bought its first permanent home at numbers 40 and 42 George Street. This is Kirkwood's map, a detail of Kirkwood's map. There's Rose Street, that's George Street. There are the assembly rooms. And number 40 and 42 were the society's first home. There was a hairdresser and perfumer on the ground floor, which means that the long history of having a shop on the premises, which, of course, Lakeland Plastics are part of the society's premises now, um, goes back to its first permanent home. <laughs> The wonderful table in the reception hall is uh, furniture from the George Street home. But it was small, and as the Society of Antiquaries moved in with the RSE, it became increasingly cramped. The Society was amongst those who petitioned the Board of Trustees for Manufacturers to use their capital resources to build what was to be called a building for the societies. The Board of Trustees was uh, a quango set up shortly after the Union to administer a fund of money given by Westminster in lieu of the taxation income which Scotland had lost at the Act of Union for investment in what we would call public infrastructure. And this is trustees were good enough to see the building of a building for the societies as a necessary part of the infrastructure. And this is Naismith's other picture. There's a partner to the one I began with showing the building of the building we now know as the RSA on Princess Street. And I always think the traffic was as chaotic then <laughs> as it is now. This is the building that was put up in 1826. And the society moved in in that year. You don't recognize it because it was very short-lived in that form. Within six years, the uh, trustees sought to enlarge it. The then president, as he moved into the new premises, was Sir Walter Scott. And he said at the time, Walter Scott was never brief, I conceive it ought to be a spur to the men of genius, knowledge, and talents by whom I see myself surrounded so as to exert themselves on behalf of the institution that it might not be said to have decreased in its literary or scientific fame while external circumstances attending its meetings were so much improved in elegance and convenience. Well, that elegance and convenience was even further improved with the extension of that building southwards to give us the building we now know. Playfair, the architect, almost doubled it in size and added these porticos to give us the RSA as we know it. That was in 1832, or 1832-33. 25 years later, work began on the second building, which we know now as the National Gallery. <coughs> Within this building, the central suite of rooms, were the exhibition rooms, first of all for the Royal Institution for the Promotion of Fine Arts, and then for the Royal Scottish Academy, which superseded it. The Royal Scottish Academy originally shared the National Gallery. The National Gallery had one half, the RSA had the other half. And the rivalry between them was so acute that every inch of, um, had to be measured out so that nobody was favored above the other. And uh, so now the Royal Institution, as it was known, became home for the Royal Society of Edinburgh, 
the Trustees Academy, the Drawing Academy, which was founded by the Trustees in the middle of the 18th century, and the Society of Antichrist of Scotland. If you can read this, this is Playfair's drawing for the building, and it's a cross-section. The exhibition hall down the center, society's rooms, that's the door of the society's rooms, are on the west side, facing out over Prince Street Gardens, with the museum that the society then had above, and the Society of Antiquities above that. I put this up because you wouldn't recognize the building now. Um, in 1909, I will come to it, it was completely changed. Now you've got two levels, and the configuration which included the RSE is really, you can't see it. Downstairs, you can see something of the original footprint, because uh, there are now two floors where originally there was only one, and the rooms at either side on the main floor have been swept away. This is what the society's rooms looked like. Very comfortable, nice armchair beside the fire. You can see that is library. And uh, laterally, after 1892, when the Society of Antiquaries moved into the portrait gallery, the uh, library began, um, it was moved partly into the two high, double height exhibition room. You can see there was a problem with the library already as the books were falling off the shelves. And uh, this, of course, is the, the meeting hall, the place where the papers were presented. The reader sat there facing the council and the president at the far end. It was a great period for society, although papers may not always have been so stimulating that even the speaker kept awake. <laughs> this is Dr. William Gregory, a very important paper actually on the purification of chloroform, but um, you might think that it was on its uses. <laughs> the painting was done by one of the most interesting members of the society, the astronomer royal, Charles Piazzi Smith, who was um, a pioneer of spectroscopy, and he was a one brilliant painter who used watercolor to study the colors in the sky. And his watercolors and photographs are part of the society's um, archive. Just some of the great figures of the 19th century, James Clark Maxwell, commemorated now in the statue by um, Alexander Stoddart, which is in George Street, and marks the society's presence in George Street, and one of its greatest figures. The Challenger expedition, expedition from 1873 to 76 was one of the biggest projects the society ever undertook and one of the most fruitful scientific expeditions ever made. It was exploration of the deep oceans and recorded more than 4,000 previously unrecorded species amongst its other discoveries. Within the Royal Institution building, the Trustees Academy must have given a flavor of perhaps even glamour. This is the Trustees Academy staircase, and the lady students were certainly an ornament to the building. In 1906, the Secretary of State decided that the Royal Scottish Academy should be given the whole of the Royal Institution building. The Trustees Academy became the um, the nucleus of the new Edinburgh College of Art. And these are some of the art students at the laying of the foundation stone of Edinburgh College of Art in 1908. But the Royal Society of Edinburgh was not given any consideration at all in the act which was called the National Gallery of Scotland Act, which made this rather draconian decision, giving the National Gallery the whole of the North Southern Building and the Royal Scottish Academy the whole of the Northern Building, and leaving the RSE potentially homeless. The presidents at the time, first Lord Kelvin and then Sir William Turner, were amongst those who lobbied furiously the Secretary of State, and with success. This is William Turner, portrait by James Guthrie, who was the president of the Royal Scottish Academy at the time. I think the portrait, which is hanging upstairs now on loan from the University of Edinburgh, records not only a friendship between the two men, but their close collaboration, because it was Guthrie who was a director of the Edinburgh Life Assurance Company, which owned this building, who tipped Turner off that the Life Assurance Company was going to move out and build itself a new building on the corner, which, of course, is number 26. And acting on that, 
And with, eventually, the support of the Secretary of State for Scotland, this building, numbers 22 to 24, uh, were acquired by the state with the Royal Society of Edinburgh as rent-free tenant. This is what George Street looked like in 1891 on an extremely wet day. Um, there, of course, is the building which at the time was the headquarters of the Edinburgh Life Assurance Company. Fascinating to see the telephone wires were already installed in 1891. This is the building as it was built in 1843 by William Byrne and David Bryce. And it is um, number 22, which is that part, was that part, and number 24, which was the top floor. So the first major alteration which gave us the confusing geography of society as it is was the joining of the top floor with its own separate staircase onto the two floors below. This is the lecture hall, which is, was in the large uh, welcome room upstairs with the hard seats which uh, the fellows sat on to listen to the learned papers. In just after the war, a very important step was taken um, in opening society to uh, lady fellows. And uh, this, I think, was an important step towards the modernization of the society. This is Charlotte Auerbach, one of the first lady fellows and one of the most distinguished fellows as a geneticist of her of that time in the society. The library was taking over. This is, believe it or not, the reception hall which you came through with a gentleman in a top hat looking after us all. In 1983, it all changed. In 1980, the society had finally decided to dispose of its library, giving to the National Library all its unique holdings of foreign periodicals. <coughs> And without the library, the building could be completely revivified. In 1983, Her Majesty the Queen opened the new refurbished building, and that is what the reception hall looks now. The same view, exactly, as I just showed you. This is the room we are in, which was um, installed at that time. And in the uh, 80s, it was clear that the long-term security of the society in the building was threatened by government policies. And remembering the unhappy events of 1906 and 1909, the council decided to buy from the government that block. Um, five years later, the insurance building came vacant. And now we have the society in the home in which we find ourselves. It's a convoluted story, but an interesting one, I hope. Thank you.